know, you can probably bring up the lights in the house a little bit, Nikki. We can see each other well. Keep everybody awake. We want to make sure we do that. We stay awake here this evening. Well, good evening, everyone. Welcome. We're a shy crowd tonight, but I'm glad you're here. And welcome to those of you who are joining us online. We're glad that you are with us. Um, later, there's going to be opportunity to ask questions. And those of you online, uh, when we get to that time, you can just type a question into the chat so that we can make sure we include the things you would like to hear us uh, respond to. But we're glad you're here to uh, hear about what's happening in our United Methodist Church, what potentially is ahead as we get ready for a general conference next year. So your presence here tonight says a lot about your interest and what is going on in the greater church. Mark and I had dinner a while ago, had a chance to talk and catch up. And, you know, one of the things that you go through when a general conference gets delayed this long is just a certain fatigue factor and a feeling like, well, aren't churches disaffiliating so everything is over and it's kind of a non-issue now? And that couldn't be further from the truth. And I think you'll appreciate that as you uh, hear us share tonight. There are still very, very critical things that have to be figured out in the next uh, year and then perhaps two years after that. So glad you're here not only to learn for yourself, but then to be a good advocate uh, of what is happening and to share with other people, maybe be able to answer some of their questions. So as we get started, would you uh, join me first in a word of prayer? Lord, we thank you for this day. I pray it's been a good day for everybody. We know that we gather in the, in the gloomy clouds of tremendous needs going on in our world. Wars that are happening in Ukraine, in Israel, the devastation that's occurring and the heartbreak as we watch images of, of people whose lives have been hurt and harmed and especially children. And then this terrible shooting last night in Maine. Gracious God, our world needs your peace. Our world needs a church that is healthy and well to offer hope to people who are hurting. So we pray for our future as a denomination in the United Methodist Church to be a, a, a fellowship of Christ followers who aren't looking to keep people out, but to welcome people in to this mission. We cannot afford to be turning anybody away to be instruments of your grace in the world. So we're grateful for everybody who's come this evening, grateful for your servant, Mark Holland, who's made the trip here to Indianapolis and for his safe arrival today. Bless us this evening and make this a fruitful time for all of us. We pray in Christ's holy name. Amen. Well, I want to welcome Mark Holland here, Reverend Mark Holland, a pastor in the Kansas, well, it's the Great Plains Conference now, Canvas is merged, they used to be two conferences, and now they've merged and also joined with Nebraska, so it's quite a large conference now. Uh, Mark has been a, a, a fully ordained elder serving in that conference since 1999, in more recent years, I've gotten to know Mark and have built a really fun friendship as we've gotten to know each other. So we're always grateful for time together. Um, Mark is also a former mayor of Kansas City. And when he doesn't have enough to do, he spends his spare time running for U.S. Senate, which he did last year as the Democratic candidate from the state of Kansas. So he manages to keep himself pretty busy, and I'll let him say whatever words of introduction he'd like to share, and then kick us off by kind of bringing us up to date. What got us here? So as we get started, would you welcome Reverend Mark Holland? Thank you. Thank you, Rob. It is, it's been a joy to work together. Rob's on the board for Mainstream UMC and has been from the beginning, and really appreciate your leadership there. Um, and your leadership here at St. Luke's because there's so much ministry to be done. So thank you for all that you're doing and for your witness here. Um, I want to, um, just a couple of housekeeping things. If you, didn't, if you didn't have a chance to sign in, you can sign on your way out. Um, if you did sign in before you came in and then you wished you hadn't, you can scratch your name out <laughs> on your way out. Um, but also, I have a card, a free souvenir for everyone who came out tonight, so hopefully you'll take one of these. They're on the table in the back as well if you didn't get one. Um, but I want to, um, I just want to start. I'm a third generation United Methodist pastor in Kansas City, and um, I love this church, as we all do. 
And it's, this isn't a hypothetical conversation for me. It's not dispassionate. It's not abstract. Um, I love the church. And I grew up in um, a Methodist parsonage, learning that uh, we are, the building's not the church, but the people are the church. And this conversation isn't about buildings. It's not about property. It's about people. And that's really where I just want us to keep that focus on why we're having this conversation. Um, I'm also a father of four uh, young adult children. They're mostly taller than I am. Um, And they want to know why we're even having this conversation. Because they're done having this conversation. And so that's part of the work we have to do is to catch up. So one of the things I like to start with is how we got here. Why is the United Methodist Church in this place? Which is an excellent question. Well, in 1972, um, somebody decided that there are gay people in the church, and so we should say something about it. And so language, in 1972, they voted to remove prohibitions from divorced clergy and added prohibition for gay people, saying that homosexuality is incompatible with Christian teaching. That phrase has been in the Book of Discipline since 1972. In the mid-80s, they realized that um, gay people might be pastors, so they made being gay a chargeable offense in the past for pastors. Um, in the 90s, they realized people might get married, so they added prohibitions about gay weddings in our churches and by our clergy. Um, and it's continually been stepped up. What you probably know is that in the United States, other Protestant denominations have already um, ordained gay and lesbian pastors and do uh, gay weddings. So why is the United Methodist Church not one of them? It's interesting because if this were a U.S. only vote, this were a U.S. only vote among U.S. delegates and U.S. churches, um, we would have joined the Lutherans, Presbyterians, UCC, Episcopalians 12 years ago. Um, 12 years ago, the U.S. had a consensus that we were ready to move forward in this. The United Methodist Church remains the largest denomination in the world that ordains women that does not ordain gay and lesbian persons. And it's in part because of the interesting global um, structure that we have. So in 1965, um, the church started to decline. Now, I prefer when my dad's in the audience because I like to say it correlates directly with when he left seminary that the church started to decline as soon as he got into the pulpit. Um, I don't blame him entirely, um, but I do like to point out when he's here um, that correlation. But the church started to decline, and prior to the 1980s, the number of delegates from outside the United States was about 6% at General Conference. Of the 1,000 delegates, about 6% were from outside the United States. Because prior to the 1980s, we would send missionaries around the world And when a church would grow to a certain size, they'd become a provisional annual conference, they would become an annual conference, and then they'd become autonomous. And so all the churches, all the Methodist churches in Mexico, the Caribbean, Central America, South America, all of those are independent Methodist churches, not associated with the United Methodist Church, because they came of age prior to the 1980s. The same is true in India, China, Korea. All of those churches came of age prior to the 1980s and became independent churches. Well, starting in the 80s, we started to retain delegates from outside the United States, the Philippines and Africa and Western Europe. The Western Europe uh, church um, are not huge numbers, but a a vibrant United Methodist church in Western Europe. Um, And Africa, as you know, has been growing leaps and bounds. Well, there was a decision made to, uh, to keep people in the United Methodist church instead of spinning them off. And there's really three reasons. One is the United Methodist church in this country is about 90% white. And it is, there is some merit to having a diverse, there's a lot of merit to having a diverse church. And so keeping delegates from outside the United States added a diversity that we didn't have in the United States. The second reason why people did that, and the next two reasons actually require different levels of cynicism, so you can decide how cynical you're feeling tonight. One is we're a declining church, and if we add Africa, we're now a growing denomination. That's just real numbers. That's true. The other piece is there were some folks who recognized that the folks coming from Africa were much more traditional and conservative than the U.S. delegates, and by retaining these delegates, you had some very reliable conservative votes 
to keep the U.S. church disproportionately conservative from the U.S. representation. So we had this change that's come about. This year, 45% of the delegates will be from outside the United States, from 6% in, 19, in the 80s to 45% now. We are the only denomination also that still has a global democratic process. Lutherans, Presbyterians, Episcopalians, UCC all have um, autonomous churches of their denomination around the world, but they're not tied to the same government structure that we are. Um, so that's, that's big. Now, we're not the largest church that has an international presence. Uh, the Catholic Church, you might be aware, um, has an international pres presence as well, but they're not a democratic process, right? So that's still run entirely by Europe um, and not run by the rest of the world. So the, United, the UMC has a unique structure. So when people are rightly frustrated about the lack of progress in our church, um, I try to remind folks that there's, there's some reasons for that. It's not that the United Methodists in the United States um, are strongly conservative that way. Uh, some are, but it's not, it's not the majority. So in 2019, we had a special general conference for human sexuality. In 2016, the church was about to fall apart. You could feel it at the general conference. This is, we counted, this is my seventh general conference. I was an alternate in 2000, and I've been an alternate or a delegate since 2000. In 2016, it was falling apart, and there was a, one of the tipping points was in a committee, there was a petition to put funding into preventing suicide by LGBTQ youth. Because LGBTQ youth have about a five percent or five times the rate of suicide um, as straight kids. So there was some effort to do some education and some resources into helping those youth. That failed in committee. It failed in committee. And there was an outrage among folks who advocated for that um, because the vote came down to this. If you're pro-gay, you vote yes. If you're anti-gay, you vote no. And that kind of voting at General Conference was destroying the church. So we came out of that and we asked the bishops to take a, um, to, to lead us and to come up with a process. So they did. They came up with a, a commission on the way forward. They did 18 months of work. They came back with a plan called the One Church Plan. The most conservative in the church were not happy with that. So they wrote the traditional plan. We came to General Conference in 2019 in St. Louis and we lost the vote for the One Church Plan by 50 votes. Out of 860 delegates, we lost by 50 votes, which means we needed 26 people to change their mind. Um, what passed instead was the traditional plan that ramped up the um, trials, yeah. that ramped up the penalties um, in an effort to kick out gay people and their allies from the church. That passed, and with that, an exit provision, which was intended for the um, liberals, quote unquote, to leave the church. And they called it their gracious exit. It didn't feel very gracious, but that was the exit that they wrote um, for everyone. Now, there were some amendments to that in what was finally adopted, but nevertheless. So what happened after that traditional plan passed, there was a lot of anguish in the United States. We know, even though it's secret ballot at General Conference, we, did a, we do a lot of counting, and we counted the delegates. We know that two-thirds of the U.S. delegates voted in favor of the One Church Plan. We know that 90% of the delegates from Africa voted against the One Church Plan and voted for the traditional plan. In fact, 60% of the votes that came for the traditional plan were from delegates from outside the United States. And the only place that it affected was the US. And there's some interesting pieces about that. The Book of Discipline has provisions where churches outside the United States can adapt the Book of Discipline for their ministry needs. That permission is not reciprocated to the U.S. church. So if we vote for something, for instance, if we said we're not going to have prohibitions against gay pastors anymore, the Africa church could put it back in for them, not for us, but for them. Vice versa, if they put in prohibitions against gay pastors, we do not have the authority to take it out. So it's a, it's a significant um, quirk 
in our structure as to why we are where we are. There was outrage from the traditional plan in 2019 and the annual conferences that followed. Um, there was significant organization and voting and centrist and progressive delegates won additional seats across the United States. And we went from two thirds of the delegates supporting the one church plan to three quarters, which is at where we are now. And we have more votes still because with the disaffiliations, about 20% of the churches have left. That has reduced the number of conservative delegates because some of them have left, not all, but some have left. But that leaves us with a need um, for, um, for, the, for the continued work to get across the finish line. And I'll talk a little bit more about that in a minute. So that's how we got to this point. Um, I'm interested in, for you, how this conversation, you've been here for 12 years. Yep. How has this conversation in the, glo in the <coughs> global and national church affected your ministry here at St. Luke's? You know, St. Luke's is um, buffered from the impact of the disaffiliations going on. Uh, a lot of the angst that congregations feel for several reasons. One, internally, uh, St. Luke's has been kind of out in front on being a welcoming congregation that for years now we've declared we're going to welcome all people. It's not been a big internal debate for this congregation. And then we have not had lots of dis disaffiliations happening right around us here in Indianapolis. Mm -hmm. So a lot of the disaffiliations in Indiana are in smaller communities. Um, you know, we, we're just not feeling that. So it's not like we're surrounded by churches voting to leave immediately here where we are. So it, 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 for me at least, I'm not inundated with conversations with people about what's happening in the global church other than more of a curiosity. Some of you will stop me sometimes and say, well, so what is going on? What is going to happen? Is this whole thing done? Are we finished with this? Or what more is, is going to occur? So that's, that's a quick response to that. That's good. That's good. I think that's the, and, and you've also been a leader in the denomination of producing materials to help churches have these conversations. Um, and you'd be surprised to know not everyone is providing leadership in how to have these conversations. There's a lot of leadership in how to not to talk about anything as long as possible. Um, but you've done, you put together some materials and right. such. How has that right. been received? Well, you know, it, it was a little bit by accident because after the 2019 special conference in St. Louis, we came back, we talked about it as a congregation. Um, there, th at that point, you might remember this. I mean, what we felt back in that period for St. Luke's was, all right, how did this come about? Mm -hmm. Is there manipulation going on with the votes coming from other continents? If so, what can be done on our part to change that? We examined many of those kinds of pieces, but part of what we were doing at the same time is, now that this has been stirred up to a pretty, pretty big level for people, um, we felt the need to have more conversation around what the Bible says for people who say, I want to be welcoming, I want to be uh, part of that St. Luke spirit of inclusive for everybody, but what do I say to my family members who ask me, how do you defend that biblically? How do you, how do you maintain biblical authority and openness for things that seem to be very clear prohibitions? Mm -hmm. So we did a class here in our gray hall, and we had over 300 wow. every week. And I was surprised by the number of people from other churches around Indianapolis, Methodist churches. Some actually, I think we had one or two who were coming like an hour or more. And when I got to know them a little bit after the classes, I found out that they were like, we're not talking about this at our church. And then I was hearing more and more from people, other conferences, other distances in Indiana saying, uh, we're not hearing anything. And so we decided to, to kind of take that class and produce it in a way that churches could use. And if you were some Sunday school class, you wouldn't need a teacher. Just uh -huh. plug in the video. Yep. And the things we found helpful were that if people were respectful and had conversation on the questions together, and then we used the same um, testimonies not just of gay people in the church here, but parents of gay children, yep. allies and advocates and why they are. And that seemed to be very powerful. And it's been amazing to me how much feedback I've gotten from churches around the country, mm -hmm. some even beyond, 
who've used this material and how helpful that it has been to them. So that's how that came about. That's great. And we simply wanted to help churches because what, what happened for St. Luke's is we've been talking about this for a while. You know, we've had Sundays where we talk about what does the Bible say about homosexuality? What should we think about same-sex marriage? It's not always been popular. You know, every time I talk about it, we have people who leave St. Luke's. But if we had waited, if we had never talked about it, we'd be in the same position where a lot of churches are, where That's all right. of a sudden now we've got to have very difficult conversations. And then it feels like half the church is leaving. That's right. Yeah. That's right. So, hey, question back to you. I want to talk about, you you've brought us up to date. This is where we are. So what is going to happen next year? But before we do that, would you say just a couple of things about, is, is this whole debate just about human sexuality? Is, is homosexuality the only issue going on? And you might tie in another question to that, that uh, there's a lot of news about the Methodist church splitting now with all these disaffiliations. What is that about? Well, it's a great question. Um, I often, having been involved in politics, I often paraphrase our Lord and say, where two or more are gathered, there will be politics also. Um, a lot of this may have to do with power and money um, in the name of Jesus, yes? That a lot of it has to do with control, and a lot of it is who's in charge of the church. Um, and so a lot of this stuff has been Unfortunately, our country, you know, our country is so divided right now, so polarized. Um, our families, our churches, I mean, it's just our neighborhoods are so polarized right now politically. In, a, in an ideal world, we would be modeling for the world how to live together with difference because we do it all the time. I've never been to a church where everyone agreed. Um, I don't think that church exists. If it did, it'd only be one person in it. So there's not any... There's, there's a lot of challenges we have with the, with the church that I don't, think, I don't think it's primarily about homosexuality. I think there's a, it's primarily about this culture war that's happening in our country. The same thing happened in the, the last time the church had a, had a significant split was around the Civil War, around the issue of slavery. And that was a polarizing issue. The country actually went to civil war over it. Um, I pray we don't. I pray that we... Um, can figure out our differences and find a way to move forward together. I wish the church, the United Methodist Church, had been leaders in how to live together, but instead we followed kind of the political piece in our country, the milieu of our country of dividing and of being angry with one another and not talking to one another and demonizing one another. It's been very tragic, which is why the conversation piece that you talked about with these materials you had to help people have respectful dialogue, yeah. Yeah. is that all we want in Congress? What if we just had, what if we put Twitter away and just had respectful dialogue instead? We might get somewhere. So this is the, I think this is a big part of what's happening to our church. We are a, we, we are a reflection of our community. And I would suggest that the United Methodist Church has always been a bit of the chameleons um, in the denominational world. You know, in the Northeast, we look a lot like the Episcopalians. In the South, we look and sound a lot like the Southern Baptists. Uh, in the north, we look and sound a lot like the Lutherans. In fact, I have a friend, she's a Methodist pastor in Wisconsin, and she does a three-year confirmation class. Hmm. That's what everybody does up there. That's what the Lutherans do. They do three years. I told her, kids in Kansas City are so smart, we can do it in six weeks. <laughs> so I don't know what they're doing up there. But the church, the United Methodist Church in California, it looks a lot like California. Yep. Yep. And so here we were holding this together, right? We had this church, and the one church plan was basically to codify who we are. This is who we are. Mm -hmm. And there were folks who said, that's not good enough. We can't, we, we have to have rules and we have to have control. And so that's what the traditional plan is about. It's about rules and control. It's about who's in charge. And the one church plan said, hey, if you're a conservative church, you go on being conservative. If you're a progressive church, you go on being progressive. If you're a purple church, just go on doing what you're doing. But that wasn't good enough, that there were folks who said, we cannot live in the same church. And that's why we talk about it mainstream. We founded in 2018, ahead of the one church plan vote, we founded around this word we made up 
called con compatibilists. It's about who can live with difference. Um, are you compatible with people with whom you disagree? And so that's been a big piece. So I don't think it's entirely about homosexuality. I think homosexuality is the face of the fight. And I'm pretty sure the gay folks are done with everyone arguing and are done being the center of attention and want to just get on with their lives. Because this focus on homosexuality is damaging not only, especially to our gay and lesbian brothers and sisters, but it's damaging to the whole church. Um, I had someone describe, actually it's Adam Hamilton in our conference, he started a little church in Kansas City. I don't know if you heard of him. Um, but Adam Hamilton said at annual conference, we need to move from a conflict-driven church to a mission-driven church. And I think that's right. And we need to move to the mission. And that's where our country needs to go. We need to stop being a conflict-driven country and move on to being a mission-driven country about what we're about. Mm -hmm. So I think that's a big part of it. Mm -hmm. um, the split looks a little <laughs> like this. Um, the split... So f there are 31,000, there will be a test, so take notes here. There, will be, there are 31,000 United Methodist churches in the United States. About 6,000 have disaffiliated. Um, that's about 20%. The jury is out what that means by membership and what it means by dollars. Mm -hmm. But we do know by number of churches it's 20%. And the demographics of the churches in terms of size re correlate very Similarly, the churches that have left and the churches that have stayed. So the split's been about 6,000, about 20% of the U.S. churches left. Um, that, if you listen to it on television, you'd think it's a 50-50 split. And it's not. Now, what's not true, what's, what's being told out there, and this is one of the things that mainstream pushes back on and, and mentions, is that the message that the folks who are the most conservative want to say is, well, the other 80% are all a bunch of liberals. Well, that's not true. Right. There certainly are progressives and liberals in that 80%. But the vast majority of folks do not identify as either conservative or liberal. They identify as people, mm -hmm. right? We just identify as us um, without an agenda. We're agenda free. We're just here for church. But there's an interest in polarizing the church. And so the, the, the disaffiliation, it has been mostly the most conservative churches, many of whom are, I would suggest, stridently anti-gay. But only about half of the churches that have left have joined the Global Methodist Church, which is the new denomination. The other half are going independent, especially the larger churches. The larger churches are going independent. So how large the Global Methodist Church actually is remains to be seen. They're going to have about 10% maybe of the total membership, maybe 15% of the membership when it's all said and done. Um, but this disaffiliation, and I'll come back to this other point in a minute, the disaffiliations end in December 31st. The so legislation that allows the disaffiliations ends December 31st, paragraph 2553. So the splits have gone on for the last year. Um, it's coming to a close. And the estimates are that it'll probably be around 7,000 churches total, which will be a little more than 20%, 21, 22% right. of the churches. And that is not all population of United Methodists. That's congregations. That's the percent of total congregations. And that's right. We still can't say for sure what that total percent of United Methodists, but I did think your statistic for your conference yeah, was interesting. Yeah, it's interesting. Yeah, the Great Plains Conference, Kansas and Nebraska, we have 1,000 Methodist churches, United Methodist churches. We've lost 25% of them. 250 churches have disaffiliated from Great Plains. That represents 4% of the membership and 4% of our budget. Um, because we in the church have the same divide we have politically between rural and urban. So you have a lot of small rural communities, um, small churches um, who have disaffiliated. And most of our urban cities, as you described in Indianapolis, right. Very few disaffiliations. We've only had two churches with more than 400 in attendance leave the Great Plains Conference. Um, most everyone else has stayed. So that's an interesting piece. Now you take the Northwest Texas Conference, 80% sure. of their churches left. Um, that's a huge loss right. from in Northwest right. Texas. So, um, so anyway, I think those, that's yeah. kind of the nature of where we are right now. Right. That's, right. that's kind of where we are. What... Um, You've answered the question about how the um, disaffiliations around here yeah. haven't really affected you. <clears throat> what, um, 
how do you as a pastor, I'd just be surprised at St. Luke's if everyone agreed on this. How do you as a pastor and how's your pastoral team reach people who are liberal and people who are centrist and people who are conservative? How do you, how do you manage that on a day-to-day -day basis? And I think that's a, a, an important question for pastors who are joining us online. I know we have a number of pastors joining by Zoom probably facing more division within your congregation than we have here at St. Luke's. My first response to that is, first of all, when we are reaching out to people, we're reaching out to people. That's right. We're not reaching out to conservative or liberal or whatever. We're just reaching out to people. Um, because we've been very declarative about being open and accepting, I think people who come into St. Luke's, many have been coming in because they're seeking that. So that's kind of a non-issue right there. But there would be other people who come in, especially before 2019, when we were talking about this, since we've been talking about this more, who wouldn't have known this is a key part of our value and who we are. And at some point along the line said, oh, oh, I didn't know that's what you stood for. No, we're going to, we're going to leave. I think with everything, we try to be gracious. Just be gracious. If people feel a need to leave, well, okay, be gracious and we, we want to bless you and go into another congregation. Um, but what I try to be careful of is feeling like we've got to keep everybody here no matter what. Because if we say, wait a minute, if you are against gay marriage, if you are against, it's okay. We want you to feel like you have a place here. I, I have a little problem with that. Because gay members of the church that can create an unsafe environment when suddenly you're in a small group, you're in a gathering, and you are hearing some people say some things that it's not the values of our church. It, it, I got in trouble with the district superintendent years ago. That's a surprise, isn't it? <laughs> um, we were in a really big debate in that church. I mean, it was a worthwhile debate. Whether to turn our old sanctuary into a youth center. Which meant we were going to take the pews out. Oh, I my mean, that, God. If you're going to fight, that's what you ought that's to be right. fighting about, right? Whether to take the pews out that's of right. the building. Well, but it became big. It became, and, and uh, there was a huge church vote about this. Mm -hmm. DS set me down beforehand. He said, I want to know what you're going to do to protect unity. And I said, eh, unity's not my concern, really. <laughs> <laughs> How did you get here is kind of what he, <laughs> he wanted to know. I said, unity around the mission is. Right. Not just unity. Unity around the mission. Unity around what the church is about. That we care about our young people. That we care about the next generation because Jesus would. That's what we've got to instill. That's right. And so I think the compatible word is key. How, if somebody is super conservative and saying, I just uh, have a hard time with this. I try to say, you know what? It is okay for you to have a hard time with it. It is between you and God to do your wrestling. But can you be in a church where people practice different from what would be your first choice? Is that, can you be compatible in that regard? And I think a lot of people who might not, it, it might not be their first choice that gay marriage is happening in their church, but they say, you know what? I'm not going to leave the church over it. I think there is a commitment to unity in Christ that allows that to be okay. But for people who just say, it is not okay, I just feel like we have to be That's free right. to allow people to find communities where they're going to enrich the community, enrich themselves. But um, yeah, I think our, our emphasis is on focusing on the mission being a church that really does welcome all, how do we live into that in a way that we, we mean it, that people are going to experience that when they come in? That, that's what's important to me. Yep, that's right. That's good. You know, we, me as a pastor, and maybe this will help some pastors who are listening, my job is to focus and work toward unity. It's, it's not to keep it. That's Jesus' job. Uh, people who feel like I, I can't stay here. If I start bearing that as like my mistake, I did something wrong. Oh my gosh, I don't think I'd have lasted this long. Right. Th that's Jesus' job. Our job is to promote unity, 
but then allow people to make decisions. And that's what I see in Jesus' ministry. Mm -hmm. He allows people to make decisions and, and, and doesn't focus on no matter what, we have to keep everyone together. Right. That's right. All right, I want to come back to you now. Let's talk about the future. I think that's what a lot of us really want to think about is what's coming up next year with General Conference, what might happen, and what should we anticipate? Well, I think we should anticipate a very hard General Conference, in part because a lot in the Great Plains, after the disaffiliations, an annual conference in June, it was the best feeling we've had in our I've annual conference for years. There was just, we weren't fighting anymore. There wasn't anybody making speeches about all y'all going to hell. You know, we were just doing a, we were just doing church. Yeah, yeah. And it was powerful. And I think that's been true. It's been true in all five jurisdictions in the United States, uh, the jurisdictional meetings, and it's been true um, in a lot of annual conferences across the country. So I think a lot of U.S. delegates think, well, it's, um, it's over. The folks are disaffiliated, and so we're all going to come in with agreement, and we're all going to hug each other. I doubt it. I do think that the, there are interesting numbers, and that's part of mainstream's job is to count the numbers and know where the votes are. This is a political process. The United Methodist Church, the Methodist Episcopal Church, after the Revolutionary War became its own denomination, it was unpopular to be British after the Revolutionary War. Do you remember that? You remember that? It was the British. Um, so the Church of England in this country became the Episcopal Church. And the Methodist version of that became the Methodist Episcopal Church. And we formed our church government. We modeled it after the U.S. government, which seemed like a really good idea. At the time. In 1784. <laughs> um, and now we're acting just like the U.S. government, <laughs> which is a disaster. So the, um, the, church, the, the general conference is a legislative body, which means it votes, which means it's a political process. Um, 45% of the votes are, in the, uh, are outside of the United States. 55% are coming from the United States. And that's disproportionate. So right now, the U.S. church, set three quarters of the U.S. church supported, supports the regionalization and removing the language. Um, but then with the disaffiliations, we've gained votes, right? We've gained additional votes because votes are allocated for general conference based on, pop, on the membership and on number of clergy. Well, we've gone down in membership and we've gone down in clergy by 20%. But we still have those delegates for this year only. The other piece is that the African delegates are not proportional yet. They've been stepped in slowly over time. And what that means, and now the African church is larger than the U.S. church that is still here. What that means is that the next general conference count the African church will be counted fully and not stepped in. We will be counted fully with a 20% reduction and we'll go from 55% of the votes to 45% of the votes in 2026. So the challenge we have is what we're gonna get done, we're gonna get done this year is my view. Um, I think waiting to 2026 is a crap shoot and we don't advocate in the United Methodist Church for shooting craps, it's gambling, right? Um, so we, we think that there's an opportunity now when we have the majority of the votes. Removing the, so there are four big things coming up. One is removing the language, the harmful language, and just removing it, not making affirmative comments, not moving towards justice, but moving towards neutrality. That's one. The second is regionalization. I'm gonna talk about regionalization because it's super confusing. Um, and then the third is uh, the global social principles. Now the global social principles in my mind could be lumped with removing the language because it's in the social principles where the incompatibility language is right. that we need to remove. The global social principles and <coughs> removing the language only require a majority vote. I think we have that. I think most of us think we have that. Regionalization requires two thirds vote. Regionalization would mean the United States, as I described, the United States can't adopt the Book of Discipline, but churches outside the United States can. 
It's because structurally the U.S. church is the center of the church, which is an old colonial model of how you organize a church. And instead, we should be regional bodies where everyone has their own regional autonomy. And the U.S. church is no longer the center of the church. So the regionalization allows each region to make their own decisions on a broader aspect of the Book of Discipline than is allowed now. And that regionalization would then allow the U.S. church and the Western European church to remove the prohibitions on um, homosexuals across the board and likely not to happen in Africa and not to happen in the Philippines. So that's the regionalization piece. The fourth piece that's going to come up is kind of the wild card, and that is there are a group of conservatives who have been advocating for people to leave the church who are not leaving themselves. You have, one, you have the poster child of this shenanigan here in Indiana with John Lomperis, um, who believes that um, even though his church disaffiliated and he's advocating for people to disaffiliate, that he should come vote somehow on the church. So there's a number of that group who have written legislation to extend paragraph 2050, 2553 to allow the disaffiliations to continue indefinitely into the future. The first draft was until 2029. There's a lot of pushback on that, but they have said, if we don't get that, we're going to sabotage regionalization. Because regionalization, unlike removal of the language, requires two-thirds vote. Well, we don't have two-thirds vote. That's a big deal. That's a very big deal. We don't have two-thirds vote. And more importantly than not having two-thirds vote at general conference, once it goes to the ratification process, two-thirds of all annual conference members present and voting, it's very specific language, mm -hmm must ratify. Well, the disproportionate number of votes that we have in the U.S. right now will be completely washed out during the ratification vote. We'll only have 45 percent of the votes going for ratification. So either Africa decides we want regionalization or it doesn't happen. That's the bottom line. The U.S. church has a consensus that we want regionalization. Um, Western Europe wants regionalization. Um, the Philippines is not sure if they want regionalization. Maybe. Um, but they have a stronger stance. Africa, we don't know. And there's, there's not a lot of statements. The bishops have said we want to continue the conversation about regionalization. Really, it's time to vote. Yeah. So that's going to be the biggest challenge. And the reason 2553 fits into that is the traditionalists have said if we don't get the, the extension on allowing churches to leave, we're going to sabotage the regionalization vote actively sabotage it. And they have an unbeaten record at General Conference for the last 40 years of sabotaging legislation. So that's the challenge that we have, and that's why it's going to be hard. Um, I do think there will be a better spirit there. I do think it will be a, a better General Conference than we've had. But there's a lot of pieces in this, and my uh, spoiler <coughs> alert, my closing statement is, don't go back to sleep. This isn't over yet. And I think a lot of people think, oh, folks have left, it's over, or it's kumbaya. It's not yet. And right. so we need to get across the finish line with these four legislative priorities. I want to interject a thought there about Mainstream, which Mark leads. I am on their board. They're an advocacy group that has risen up uh, initially to help advocate for the United Methodist Church becoming more inclusive. In years since the postponement of 2020 General Conference, it's been to advocate for churches remaining United Methodist, but also to be more inclusive. One of the things that's happened in the last few years is a lot of these groundswell groups that started back in 2019 to rally the centrist, progressive United Methodists in the country have kind of gone away or they fizzled out. There, there was mainstream, there were a lot of others. The others aren't actively advocating. And so mainstream is one of the sole voices now trying to educate our delegates. Mark said he went to, he was part of a delegation meeting recently where some of the delegates being elected, this is their first general conference. They've never been to a general conference. They're not even sure how the church works. And they didn't even know what regionalization was. And so <laughs> to get that two-thirds vote, it's going to take a lot of work. And that's why the work that they are doing 
uh, we are doing, but Mark's a key leader of it out on the, the front line of it, is really, really important. Mm -hmm. So I just wanted to add that in there well, thank to, you. to help understand why is this still such a big deal? Because th there are some big votes to happen next year in Charlotte and then again in 2026. That's right. And to have some advocacy to help with the ratification process, um, because that has to happen conference by conference to help educate folks. And it's it's new, it's a new idea. Well, let me rephrase that. This legislation's new. Regionalization actually passed in 2008 and passed a general conference with a two-thirds vote and it failed at ratification. Um, in, 2000, in 2016, 2016, we passed a constitutional amendment that said women are equal in the eyes of God. Radical stuff got the two-thirds at general conference and failed at ratification. So it's the, the ratification is a whole nother political animal in terms of, of getting the votes. A lot of work has to be done for that. So yeah, yeah. we have a two-year process yeah. of getting the votes. That Are we you need. ready to go to questions? I am. So we want you to feel free to ask some questions. I'm going to grab the mic and walk around because if I walk around with the mic, then Mark has to answer by himself. <laughs> so he can be the sole answer. If you're online right now, if you would open up your chat, just put in any uh, questions that you have there and we'll take a moment to see what questions are coming up out of the chat. John Guild, I know you had the question about how it looked like with that traditional vote in 2019, the traditionalists sort of took hold and had power of the church. And now, with changes of delegates in 2020, all of that shifted, and it looks like the traditionalists are leaving through disaffiliations, and how did that come about? I hope through what has been shared, it kind of makes sense how that turned about, but it is, it is not such that it says, oh gosh, well, all of the traditionalists are gone, and now we can just pass legislation with a lot of ease not quite true we still have a good number of traditional lay delegates especially to general conference who could perhaps be enough to block a regionalization plan that could kind of move us forward as a church and allow us to stay as one united methodist church with all of our global entities like africa like the philippines it is a big deal from what i understand in african united methodist to keep that label. They want to be known as the United Methodist Church. They're just not so keen on changes that we would want to make to the discipline in the United States. So the regionalization would allow us to still be one church, but to allow some separation. So uh, if you have a question, just raise a hand. Well, and while you're, you. taking that, while you're taking those questions, I would add to it, after 2019, when they basically the, the most conservative folks in the church won the vote and lost the church. And the votes that happened afterwards, the outrage in the United States flipped the US votes. And I think the traditionalists saw the, tr the writing on the wall that they were not gonna be able to enforce because we're not gonna elect bishops anymore who are gonna do trials. So without the bishops to do the trials, there aren't any trials. Without, the, without that ethos, so they felt like they lost the U.S. church and that they needed to be the ones to leave rather than wait for others to leave. Hi there, thank you for being here. My name is Linda and I'm from Carmel United Methodist Church, Linda Withrow. Um, and my question is about regionalization in the United States. Yep. So would it be just one, we would be one region or you know, because what I, here's my thought. I don't want us to break up into like several regions within the United States. I'd like us to be one region, but I don't know what the thoughts are on that. It's a good question. The current legislation says that the United States would all be one region. Um, there is a discussion because the current draft that has come out does not include jurisdictions or only U.S. can have jurisdictions. There's some discussion about jurisdictions, whether other regions could have jurisdictions as well. There are some folks in the United States who really want jurisdictions because there's a lot of identity there. Um, there are other folks who don't know if jurisdictions are a, an, a legacy of the past. So that's the one region is baked into it. Whether or not there are jurisdictions 
is yet to be determined. And what is the jurisdiction? So there are five jurisdictions in the United States, um, the Western, North Central, North, South Central, Northeast, and Southeast. And the only real function of the jurisdictions is to elect bishops. So the jurisdictional delegates, you have the same number of jurisdictional delegates as you have in, uh, general conference delegates. So, and all your general conference delegates can vote at jurisdictional, but also you add that number again for jurisdictional delegates. And the only purpose of the jurisdiction really is to elect bishops. And so people run for bishop within that cluster of states and they get elected from that cluster and they serve in that group of states. Um, it is possible to elect someone from a different jurisdiction to be your bishop, but it's, un it's unusual. So that's really the only function that they have. Basically, it'd be the same as it is now. Okay, mm -hmm. okay I'm Sandy Harlan. Um, you mentioned 2026 a couple of times. Um, because we're quadrennial, our next general conference would be 2028. Where is 26 coming in? Is that the ratification deadline? That is an out. I can take that one. Take that one. <laughs> Council, an of bishops, Council of Bishops, anticipating that we're not going to get all the business done next year. Um, want to go ahead and plan on a 26 conference so that it's not another entire four years that things get put off. For instance, let's say we spent a lot of time working out a regionalization plan, but they're still going to have to have a lot of reorganization of the entire denomination, and we don't get the language changed in the discipline. What is that going to mean? And instead of waiting four years, they are proposing one of two things. They're meeting in just a few weeks at Lake Junaluska. One will be to use their authority as the council to call for a special session of general conference, just like 2019, or to refer to the general conference next year to call for a 26. And inside word is they're going to use their authority to go ahead and make that plan and call for a special session. So that's why you're hearing this about 2026. Hope it Th turns out better than the last special conference. Yeah, yeah, that's right. Amen. Did I get that right? That's right. And the other piece that there's a push, there's actually a petition. David Livingston, who's a board member for Mainstream, submitted a petition asking that 2026 be the new beginning of the quadrennial and not have 2028 but jump to 2030, in large part to get us off of the presidential cycle because there's no time mm -hmm. when the U.S. is more divided than during our presidential elections. And every single time we go to general conference during that cycle. John Dane, St. Luke's. Uh, a question on the African delegation. It sounds like they're very important based on percentage, based on growth. And it, as you've talked, it's, it struck me that uh, the regionalization would benefit them because they could develop their own, uh, their own set of rules and their own set of disciplines and so forth. And as you talk some more, and as Rob talked a little more, so, you know, they may feel that they're losing control or losing impact on the broader church. So that might be what's going back and forth in, in their thinking. You would know more than I would. But it, it seems like a very important component to the conference. It is very important. And the key that we ran into in the United States was the one church plan was really a regional plan. The conservative conferences could stay conservative. The conservative churches could stay conservative. There's no one trying to change that. Um, and the question was, is this enough room? And the answer from the US traditionalists was no. We're not comfortable being in a church where there are progressives who are ordaining gay and lesbian pastors. We're not gonna be in that same denomination, um, not even in the same annual conference. The question for the African delegates is that we don't know the answer to, is does regionalization provide them enough distance in a way that it did not provide enough distance for the US traditionalists? That's the question that we don't know the answer to. And every annual conference, not every annual conference, but many annual conferences in the US, all five jurisdictions, all the annual conferences in the Philippines have all voted to support the concept of regionalization, done official votes, aspirationally. The only place we haven't had any votes is in Africa. So we just don't know where the rank and file delegates are in Africa. And that's part of our work is to find out that information. I'm Marty Hansucker, St. Luke's. I have been part of the delegation from St. Luke's who's 
uh, done several African missions. I've been to Africa three times. I think the Griffiths have been there, what, eight or nine times. But my question centers around what happens to the mission component of the church when we're split apart like this? That, you know, Wesley basically called us to be the parish to the world, and that, that's an influence I, I don't see in some of the other discussions. Well, the, the question is an excellent question. What happens to the mission of the church? What we know is that in the annual conferences, like the Texas annual conference that lost half their membership, they lost half their budget, which impacts camping ministries, campus ministries. It impacts missional giving, right? I mean, that, it's very real that we just have a smaller pot. It looks like the United Methodist Church in the U.S. is um, likely going to have about a 40% budget cut. Um, now, a lot of that, I mean, I don't know. I, I've talked to Rob about this at dinner. Church is hard on a good day. Amen? I mean, it's, it's, not, a, it's not a slam dunk doing church these days. And so it's already hard. COVID made it harder, right? This bickering in the church makes it even harder. So getting past that to the mission focus and using our resources for mission um, rather than for church fights. I think that's where we're trying to push us is to get that mission back at the center of the church. Let's check online and see if we have any questions. Nikki, what have you got? Yeah, we have over 100 people watching online right now. Uh, and here's a question. Since all the delegates are set for the tw from the 2020 conference, how can we best support delegates who may not have changed in terms of people, but have definitely changed in terms of everything that's happened? Okay, I'm not sure I understand that question. Um, Sounds like you're, you're, the person is asking the delegations, it's the same delegation for 2020, and the question was how do we support yes. the delegations, mm -hmm. even though there may be some shifts in their thinking, and the truth is th there's been huge shift in the thinking of delegations as a whole. Let me take Indiana as an example. So, first of all, the 2020 election totally turned over the clergy delegation in terms of ideology. It was almost an entire traditional slate that became an entire um, moderate, centrist, progressive slate. Now, with disaffiliations going on, um, members of the laity, the lay delegates, who with integrity are saying, I'm not a United Methodist anymore. My church disaffiliated. My membership is no longer in a United That's Methodist Church. I cannot stay on the delegation. So we've had openings now of lay delegates, and we elected lay delegates at this past annual conference in Indiana. So there's even more shift going on. Now, as to how to support, did I give you enough time to come up with sure, an answer? I think that I think the <laughs> nice, nice job. Thank you. Um, I think the way we support the delegates, one, we have to get folks information this is complex legislation this these are to get to regionalization it's eight constitutional amendments this is not this is hard um, it would be it would be hard legislation if everything were going well and this is hard legislation when we have when we have a lot of challenges so educating the delegates about what the what the legislation is and what's the most important legislation you, you get a book in the mail that has 5,000 petitions in it 5,000 well I can tell you about 50 of those are going anywhere right only about because anybody can write a petition and boy there's some churches that found out they could write a petition and by golly they do they write a petition about all kinds of things so you have to sort through, you have to be able to sift through the pile of petitions to get to the most germane ones. And really there are four main issues. Regionalization, um, removing the language, global social principles, and 2553 disaffiliations. Those are the key issues. Those are the most important issues that are transformational issues, not just technical issues. Yeah. You have another, Nikki? And then we'll yeah. go back in the I room. I have another question from Richard asking, uh, we keep hearing that the African churches receive huge financial support from the U.S. Methodist churches and then continue to vote against our interests on the issue. Uh, is that a true statement? 
That's an excellent question. So it is true, pre-COVID, the global Methodist budget was $135 million. That's all the apportionments in the, uh, put together. Um, $135 million, that doesn't count annual conference budgets, that's just the general church budget, was $135 million. Pre-COVID, 99.6% of that came from the U.S. churches. So the vast majority of the money comes from the U.S. churches and, very, and, and, and a decreasing number of votes. So it is true that the, uh, we have a, an Episcopal fund that pays all the bishop salaries in the U.S. and all the bishop salaries overseas all come out of the same fund. Uh, we also support offices and missions. We do a lot of support and send a lot of money overseas um, to support it, which most people want us to be doing. If we're going to be spending money on things, we should be supporting people overseas. Uh, we're building wells for water. We're helping build um, clinics for children. We're, we're building hospitals. We're doing all kinds of amazing work. I, I was in Congo in 2009, and if the United Methodist Church and the Catholic Church hadn't done anything, there wouldn't be anything there. The only two hospitals, one Catholic, one Methodist. There are only, you know, two doctor's clinics, one Catholic and one Methodist. I mean, if, they, if the churches weren't doing anything, it wouldn't be there. And so that's, that's a critical part of, of who we are. So yes, it is true a lot of the money comes. Here's the hard question. Is anyone in the church liberal enough or conservative enough to turn over their checkbook to someone else? I doubt it. And the crisis around money is a real crisis that will come to a head at some point, if not at this general conference. And then you start talking about power and control, you start talking about colonialism, you start talking about all the negative things, because it is not fair and just that the US has more money than everybody else in the world combined. It's just not fair. And it's also true. And so how we manage those resources is a big part of what regionalization, the risk is if we split up, we support zero f um, direct funding in Mexico, South America, India, and China, because those are autonomous Methodist churches. So any ministries, and you may have some in the Indiana Conference who have Central American missions. Well, that's an individual church and maybe sometimes an annual conference. But those churches are not receiving any general Methodist, United Methodist funding because they're autonomous. So going all autonomous, which is the other option, if regionalization falls apart and the church just falls apart and we end up in our own regions, we'll all be autonomous and then it will be much more difficult to resource the missions in Africa that we want to resource. Hi, I'm Lori from uh, St. Luke's and Mark, just a big thank you for your energy and, and, and keeping this topic alive and just seeing it to the end. So thank you for thank everything you. you're doing. Um, I'm not sure how healthy this question is, but, um, you know, plan A, it sounds like plan A requires a lot of things to come together at the same time, at the right time, at the, at the best time. Uh, is a plan B at all being entertained or is that dangerous to even think about? And, and part of the plan B, I guess, uh, would be how long are we willing to wait for all of these things to come together if in fact this strike of plan A doesn't come together in time? It's an excellent question. What's plan B? Um, there's a lot of discussion about it. After the one church plan, we didn't have a plan B and we got stuck with the traditional plan. Um, I think there are two things that are true that we start from. One is the U.S. church is not going to stop ordaining and doing weddings for LGBTQ persons even if the discipline continues to tell us not to. The African churches are not going to ordain gay and lesbian people and are not going to do gay weddings even if the United Methodist discipline told them to. Right? It's mutually exclusive at this point. We're very different on these issues. So the question is, is regionalization enough space? If the answer is no, we're not going to control each other. And I think, that's the mo I think that's the paradigm shift regionalization provides, is it's moving from control to cooperation. And that's the, that's the shift we have to make. What's gonna end up happening, I believe plan B, and this is very unpopular, is UMC USA, which is exactly what the Presbyterian Church is, is Presbyterian USA. 
It's what the Lutheran Church is. It's what the Episcopalian Church is. We all have a USA after us. Uh, we would prefer to stay a global church. We want to stay in mission and ministry together. It makes us a better church. It makes us a stronger church, a more dynamic church. But the reality is, the no one's... If, if we were controlling Africa and we didn't have that paragraph in there that allowed them to adapt the book of discipline to their own principles, they would have already left, right? It, you just can't control, the paradigm of control is over, not for every church, but for ours. And I think the plan B is gonna be a loss of relationship, which I think is the tragic loss if we don't get regionalization and why I'm passionate about trying to get regionalization passed. But it's an excellent question, and yes, we do have people actually drawing up documents about what Plan B looks like, how we vote on it, how we decide it. It becomes a very messy public divorce if we don't get regionalization. And I'd like to be out of the papers. <laughs> um, I'm Fletcher Graham from here in St. Luke's in Indianapolis. I've got two one, one's a quick question, the other one is a little bit more difficult and very sinister. Uh, first of all, we know historically about the uh, Episcopal term of Judith Craig, Bishop Judith Craig. And uh, I know where I went to seminary, she became the theologian in residence following her Episcopal term. And it seemed to go just fine knowing what she was. And she was a woman and was a lesbian. Uh, and, you know, we, I guess, historically, we've been there done, and done that. And that's why I wonder what the movement that's moving is so really possessed about, about other than the difficulty we're having with the language and the discipline. I'll get to the sinister one if you wish to react to that first. Well, I, um, Bishop uh, Karen Olivetto was the first gay bishop elected in the United Methodist Church. She was in the Western, she's in the Western jurisdiction, has been serving faithfully and ably. Um, for her time as bishop. Um, we've since elected, uh, a, the Western jurisdiction elected um, another gay uh, bishop as well. And the reason that was able to happen was because of our denominational structure with jurisdictions, that the only people who could bring charges against a bishop are members of the council of, of the college of bishops of that jurisdiction. And because the college of bishops in the Western jurisdiction was fine with it, no charges were brought. And so we too have had and, and it's just this, it's, it's this messaging of, are there gay people serving ably in ministry in the United Methodist Church right now? The answer is yes. Um, we just need to make it official. The don't ask, don't tell is what's harming people right now. Thank you. The sinister part here is that somewhere I heard a rumor at, for either 2016 and, and the 2019 conference in St. Louis that the traditionalist um, who were here, the ones who wanted to leave, and that, those people in that movement were actually supporting some of the foreign delegates in exchange for having the delegates vote as they persuaded. And I, I, I'm, I'm not real happy about hearing that votes were bought. Well, I can tell you there's, there's some stuff that has come to light. In 2012, not 2012, 12, 20, uh, 2008 in Fort Worth, there was phone gate where the traditional groups bought cell phones for all the international delegates and were texting the answers to how to vote during the general conference. That was published in the United Methodist Communications. It was exposed. Um, it, was a, it was a wanton attempt to manipulate votes. Um, you also have to remember in general conference there are seven languages spoken, seven official languages spoken. There are many more languages spoken, but there's seven official languages. So everything's translated. So we are constantly being told, speak more slowly, speak more slowly, so it can be translated. So the difficulties of communications are real. And to manipulate that by just texting someone a Y or an N for yes or no is wrong. And we know it's happened. We also know that there were um, these meals that were put on by the good news um, for all the international delegates where during the meal they would, they would get a free meal and they would get um, the voting chart for the next round passed out. So there's been a lot of attempts at manipulation um, that's outrageous. 
Um, there have been some other rumors of even more crazy things that we can't verify. But we do know that um, it's not been, not everyone's been on the up and up. Because there are people who believe this in this country, that the end justifies the means. If you get the righteous legislation, it doesn't matter if you lie, cheat, or steal to get it. Right? Those of us in this church tradition, we believe that the, end, the means must match the integrity of the end. It's a very different way of looking at the world. Let's do another question from the floor, and then we'll check with online, and then we'll need to start moving toward a close. Okay, Sandy Harlan. Um, I get the UM News communication daily in my email, and over the past year or two, uh, there has been conversation in that document about um, the African bishops coming together to be more supportive of the U.S. And now I'm wondering, am I misreading that? No, I think that's right. I think the bishops in Africa have been much more willing to say we want to stay United Methodist. But they've also said, but we don't want the language to change. What folks want is status quo. That's what we all want, isn't it? No. But the status, they, the, that there is a desire to stay United Methodist. The bishops have, in Africa have been very verbal about that. Um, but they have not come out and said regionalization is the way we're going to do it. I have three emails from three different bishops in Africa who have all said the same thing. And that is, we want to stay United Methodist if the language doesn't change. That's a big if. But yes, the African bishops are being very vo vocal about wanting to stay in the UMC. And I think it's genuine. I think, they do wanna, I think we do want to stay in mission and ministry together. Nikki, do you see another question that might be different from what's been asked so far? Uh, yeah, we've got a question from John who asks, how will the African churches be impacted financially with regionalization? That's a good question. Obviously, the, the good political answer is, depends on what the general conference votes for. That's a lame answer too, but... The, the reality is we have a funding formula now that would largely stay intact. Now, there's going to be cuts to every budget in the, in the church. There's no way around it because of the disaffiliations. So the, nu the number of dollars we're going to have available for mission is going to be reduced by maybe 40%. That's about an $88 million down from $135 million. That's a big loss. So the funding's already impacted no matter what happens. If we pass regionalization, the funding structure largely stays in place as it is. If we become autonomous, the United Methodist Church doesn't send any money to any autonomous church because the definition of autonomous, it means autonomous. And so that's what happened. I mean, the funding would end if we don't, if we're not in a regional relationship. Um, there's something else that, that about that question that I wanted to say about the, um, I don't remember what it was though. I'll catch the next train. Um, let's get ready to close. What's your hope for the United Methodist Church? I'm very hopeful that the spirit of unity and not unity at all costs, but unity of mission will prevail. Mm -hmm. My hope is that we can stay in mission ministry together with folks with whom we strongly disagree. You know, in Africa, we're asking Africa to consider this issue, to have a dialogue about homosexuality. We have, we have United Methodist churches in 26 countries in Africa. In 16 of those, homosexuality is illegal. Punishable by fines, prison, and even death. Nigeria just had a big rounding up uh, at a gay birthday party. He arrested 75 people for purportedly being gay. I mean, it's a very hostile environment for the LGBTQ community. And so... The, that's real. My hope is we stay in mission and ministry together. That we don't have to divide up the global church um, for this, for, for one thing. That the mission matters. So that's my hope. And I do think it's, I think it's real. I do think there's a renewed hope that I'm seeing around the country. I was just talking to a colleague in Kansas who's in rural Kansas. And all the churches around him disaffiliated. And people are looking for a new church. Um, he's actually had a 40% increase in attendance mm. um, since the disaffiliations happened. And he's also helping another church in a more remote rural community um, create a house church. And the conference is providing some resources for that. There's a lot of signs of hope out there 
where we're not going to let the division define us. We're going to let the mission define us. And we've got to move past the conflict and move forward. So that's my hope. And um, I will tell you, I'm a third generation Methodist in three different denominational structures. My great grandfather was ME South, my dad was ME, and I'm United Methodist. So if there's another structure for the next generation, that may be what it is. Mm. Um, but I'm hopeful that the Wesleyan tradition of grace mm -hmm. continues to be spread around this country. Yeah, yeah. And, and also, uh, the difference in politics between black and white thinking is gray. The difference in the church between black and white thinking is grace. And we need to stay in the grace. Good That's moment. my hope. Yeah. What, what's your hope for this church? For St. Luke's here in Indianapolis. Yep, yep. That, that we will continue to live out our mission, but fold this topic in the United Methodist Church here at St. Luke's into our focus on helping reach people, reaching people for becoming disciples of Jesus Christ. There's any number of ways every week we connect with somebody who has been turned off with church. Church had never been on their radar. All kinds of reasons why that happens. Um, I think to be able to ramp up that mission of saying we do live in a world where people are looking for that knowledge of grace and love and acceptance, a place where they can grow in their faith, where they don't have to hide who they are. Um, you know, it is such, I, I'm amazed all the time by people who come to St. Luke's and say things like, boy, I just didn't know a church like this existed. And my first thought is, dang, how are we not getting the word out? Mm -hmm. <laughs> how can anybody in Indianapolis maybe not know this? So there's always room to grow there. And it's also an awareness that there's, there's just so many people that on this matter have been hurt by the church. Um, there's this great opportunity. So... I'm leading this class on Wednesday nights on the Faithful Inclusive, and a guy comes last week for uh, the first time, and I recognize him because I see him at the Y, and I have seen him at the Y for years, but I never talked to him because, honestly, he's intimidating. He's, like, ripped, you know, every muscle in his body. You're selling yourself short, Rob. You're ripped. selling yourself short. <laughs> well, yeah. <laughs> um, so... We get in a conversation, and I showed Matt Bay's video, if any of you have seen that before, his, his own story. And he said to me, um, Matt Bay's story is my story. That's my story. That's what happened to me. I was in a church that was super conservative. It, uh, my, my family forced me into conversion therapy. It just about drove me to suicide. And so he tells me this story, and I was done with church. I never wanted to be near a church again. And a year and a half ago, I started watching St. Luke's online. Now, I still have yet to find out how did he learn about St. Luke's to watch online. But he just starts talking about connecting with St. Luke's. And he said, so I recognized you, you know, a long time ago, but I was afraid to talk to you because you always looked like you were pretty intense on the machine. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, well, I'm not looking like you are. Um, so it's just interesting to think, you know what, we, we are connecting with people. And, and to be able to just widen that, to say we're connecting with all people, and we've got a big enough challenge in this post-COVID world, we are still less than 50% in person every Sunday. Mm, mm. Less than 50%. That's across the board. I'm and hearing that everywhere. I just think, okay, how do, we, how do we help connect people with, with in-person community? You know, the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. And I think we experience God's presence in flesh with each other. And so that's my hope. That's my hope that we will be that's able great. to live out our mission even more where we're beyond having to talk about what's happening in the denomination. You know, we're proud to be United Methodist. We're proud to be St. Luke's. I love it. Thank you. Um, I want to say a word about mainstream and then let, uh, let Mark say a further word about it. Uh, this is an important advocacy work that's going on but they are running on having to generate their own resources and their own funding. And if you are at all in a position where you can consider making a significant gift to support this work, it helps Mark get to places, it helps them get out the materials that they are. And I believe what they're doing could be the tide determiner for General Conference next year and after that in 2026. 
And you may know of some folks who say, you know what, I quit giving to St. Luke's or I quit giving to a United Methodist Church until this deal gets changed. I'm not giving anymore. And you may say, you know what, I get that. What about supporting an agency that's trying to make the change? Because without that work, it might not happen. And, and maybe you know of some people you can offer that, but you might want to be in touch with Mark directly. What, what would you share? Well, I thank you for that. If you um, have a card, the um, card does have information. There's a QR code. You can, it'll take you to our website. There are opportunities to contribute. Um, there have also been some folks who have made some very large gifts, you know, over $5,000 that um, if you know someone that's interested in that, we'd be glad to talk with you about it. It takes from everywhere from $5 to $5,000 to fund the work. Um, but the, the key work that we do, we are, um, we are a communications organization. We are a PR firm. Uh, we have served in that role for the denomination for the last five years. And the chair of our board, Tim Crouch, runs a, um, a PR firm in Dallas, Texas. They host our website and our social media work. Um, so our work is about getting the word out to the delegates, educating the delegates, educating people in the pews who wonder what's going on, um, giving people hope that our church is m able to move forward and doing the, the vote counting, the strategic vote counting and the committees. Um, we're working with a coalition of the willing, as we call it, around the church who are working on that um, and staying in dialogue with, the, with all of the delegates and reaching the delegates outside the United States to build that relationship. That's the key work that we have to do right now. We want to stay in mission together and we want to make sure folks around the world hear that loud and clear. We want to be in mission together. So any support that you could provide to help us do that would be greatly appreciated. Awesome, awesome. I know you'll be available to uh, chat with folks um, afterward. And I want to thank you for coming tonight. I want to thank you for caring enough about the church to be here, to learn, to ask questions. Thanks to those of you online who have joined. And sorry we didn't get to all the questions that you see in the chat. But I hope we got to some key ones that maybe weren't asked here in the room, but I know Mark would love to hear from you, so Absolutely. you can get that information. Yeah, info at mainstreamumc.com. Um, you can send me a question. If you have a question, feel free to send it along. I'll try to answer it as quickly as I can. Great, great. So thank you guys for joining us. And let me close this with prayer, and then we can be about our, our way tonight. And if you have questions, come up and, and yeah, engage Mark. Uh, gracious God, thank you for helpful conversation. I hope it has been meaningful, enlightening for some who are here who maybe didn't fully understand all these matters, uh, for all of us to think about the importance of what lies ahead, that there are still some important challenges that we must overcome to be that fully open, inclusive, and welcoming church. I'm so thankful for St. Luke's. It is a gift mm. and an honor to be the pastor of this incredible congregation, and I wish every United Methodist Church had this heart. And so spreading that heart, spreading that, that open love and acceptance that we believe is an expression of discipleship to Jesus Christ is what we want to see happen more and more in United Methodism. So may we continue to impact that work every way we can to be hopeful about the future, to know that what we are, are working toward is the cause of all causes. Hmm. It's what matters. It's what will outlast us. It's what will go on for eternity. So use us in shaping that for the sake of lives who would know your love and grace for them and let them know that uh, they are cared for by a loving Savior in a community where they feel safe and welcomed. Mm. Bless us to that end, and may we all have a good evening ahead and uh, bring us back together in person on Sunday. Amen? Amen. Amen. All right. Good night, everybody. Thank you. Thank you, Rob. Thank you for your team.